This program is made possible by the support of Delta Dental, Quick Trip, Marshfield Clinic Health System, Wisconsin Counties Association, Wisconsin Hospital Association. Watch Wisconsin Eye on Spectrum Channels 995 and 363 and at wisi.org. Check one, two, three, four. Mic check one, two, three, four. Testing the level, testing the level. Everyone sounds good. Look, the looking part, I can't help it. As long as it sounds good, we're happy.
Good morning. Today, the assembly will vote to direct Governor Evers to update the unemployment insurance IT systems. Uh, hopefully, it will finally put an end to his excuses, which we have heard for literally months for not starting the upgrades himself. Uh, there have been many missed opportunities and a lack of urgency by the Evers administration to address many of the issues with unemployment insurance that we have seen throughout the pandemic. For those of us who forget, he fired his own DWD secretary because he was inept at dealing with the problem, but it took months to get there. If you recall, last spring, Governor Evers shut down the state with no plan to help those who were unemployed. The problems kept growing, got worse, and literally tens of thousands of Wisconsinites had to wait weeks, many even months, for the benefits that they should have gotten. To be clear, none of the three nonpartisan audit, uh, audit bureau reports of DWD recommended the upgrade to the IT systems. However, the audits did show that less than 1% of the calls that were answered at the call center during the height of the pandemic actually were uh, helped. We also saw that DWD was responsible for 85% of the delays in payment. So let's just be careful. When the governor tries to blame it on this old, outdated system, the reason that calls weren't answered was because the agency head who was fired didn't do his job. The reason that we didn't get the payments out to those who deserve them was because the audit showed 85% of the time it was decisions made by the Evers administration to not make the payments. So the legislation before us today provides a very simple and easy roadmap for the governor to finally move forward at DWD. Uh, Representative Bourne will talk about why many of these things could have happened earlier, but if the governor needs us to have a vote in the legislature to require him to do his job, that's why we are here today, because the people of Wisconsin have been waiting far too long for us to deal with many of the situations caused by Governor Evers. So I'll turn it over to Representative Bourne. All right, thank you, Speaker. Uh, what are we? Good afternoon. Um, so we're here today for the exact reason that the Joint Finance Committee was brought together on this bill last week because Governor Evers has failed to lead on the IT issues at the Department of Workforce Development. Uh, we, he says it's a priority. Senator Mark Lyon and I spelled out in a letter over a month ago um, trying to connect the dots for the governor, the variety of ways that he could address this issue if he thought it was a priority and he simply refused to lead on it. So we brought forward this bill, uh, amended the special session bill to give him the roadmap, as the speaker said, and how he can address that issue. Also included four UI provisions that he vetoed in AB1 that are important to, uh, as a number of things were in that bill regarding the pandemic specific to UI on these four provisions. And uh, included uh, another uh, item that was uh, vetoed in AB1 that's important to uh, businesses who are working hard to protect their uh, employees and their customers as they move through this national pandemic, uh, a provision that helps them avoid uh, frivolous lawsuits. And so we're here, as I said, because the governor wouldn't lead. And uh, last week, the Joint Finance Committee met, amended this bill, passed it unanimously, uh, moved through the Senate floor, and we're looking to uh, have it move through the Assembly floor today uh, to give the governor the roadmap so he can address um, what he says is an important issue, but could not figure out a path to do it on his own. We're glad to help him with this bill today. And with that, um, the speaker, I would imagine, can take questions. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> Rob. Yep. You guys have spent the last couple of months calling you as a dictator, saying you take a goal and approach to government. Here he reaches out to you guys to do a UI bill, and you're saying you should do it on his own. So which is it? Should you act on his own, or should you work with you guys on important issues of the state of Wisconsin? Wow, you are good at picking up the Democrat talking points. That's really? a good one. Yeah, I mean, seriously. So, I mean, the whole point that it comes down to, JR, is that there are certain things that administrative function is able to do. Um, we know it's very easy to be able to go out, spend some money on the UI upgrades. It's already within his purview. There's no question about that. Um, it could have been done a long time ago, frankly. So for him to then come and say, to try to shift blame and somehow make it seem like it was the legislature that didn't choose to upgrade the IT system, um, he didn't ask for it in his last budget. I really have not seen any news stories where any of you have focused on saying Governor Evers' own budget never called for the upgrade. Period. It didn't. 
right? Let's put that in the news story. So to make it somehow seem like the legislature didn't address this, even though we supposedly knew for years that this was a problem, it wasn't in Governor Walker's budget, it wasn't in Governor Eber's budget. So to somehow think that we should be, you know, omnipresent to understand that that was an issue, I don't think we did, frankly. Um, and I don't think Governor Ebers did either. But then for him to watch what happened over the course of months to, again, have people who were inept at the agency so bad that they had to be fired, to literally have people where less than 1% of the calls were answered. And that took months to solve. I mean, they, it basically took until they brought in the private sector to figure out how we could make people's private sector or private unemployment insurance payments. Google was the one that helped us do that. Well, congratulations to Governor Ebers for finally bringing in the private sector to solve a problem created by the public sector. And now here we are, lastly, where we know he has the ability under current law. The Fiscal Bureau has the memo. It was very clear. He could have done this weeks ago. But instead of reaching out and saying, let's work together on this, which he did not do, he said, I'm going to do a special session call with no consultation with any legislator. So if he really wanted to say, let's work together because, hey, this is a bipartisan problem. Let's put together a package. Let's see how we can do it. That would have been a sincere effort. But again, to just throw something out there and try to shift the blame, which is what Governor Evers is best at, is what frustrates me and why I don't like the idea that people somehow make the case to equate that working together on the pandemic, which is what most governors across the country have done, and not doing something on unemployment insurance and making it appear that he wants to work with us as a way to shift blame when it's entirely his fault is what's frustrating. On liability protections, critics say that's going to encourage businesses not to keep people safe. Why keep this in the bill? You know, it's actually been something that's happened around the country, so we're not the first state that's going to adopt these. Uh, I certainly know that if you talk to almost any business owner that I have met with, or frankly a lot of my friends and supporters, they want their employees to be safe. They know that when customers walk into their store, they have to take appropriate measures to guarantee that their customers are going to want to return. Um, I don't know how many of us have seen, but almost in every store now you have a circle that you're supposed to stand on to maintain social distancing. So a lot of those things went into place not because of a government mandate, because they wanted to keep their employees employees and customers safe. So the difference is, even by doing all those things, the very threat that we'll now go into in the next phase where a bunch of folks who want to get rich quick scheme or try to get some kind of a, a, a threatened settlement, right, where somebody might have caught COVID, they might have got it at the bowling alley, they might have gotten it at a restaurant, they might have gotten it at home, we have no idea where they got it. Uh, and to now say that a lawyer is going to be able to try to make you, when you're in trouble as a business owner, potentially spend lots of dollars on fighting against a frivolous lawsuit, I think having the certainty that this provides, it still means it just raises the bar. doesn't mean you can't sue. It just means that it's a higher standard than kind of uh, allowing for a frivolous lawsuit under the current law. We just haven't seen those lawsuits yet, though. We haven't, but now I know I can actually let Representative Bourne talk about it. It's his bill. But we've started to see people begin, uh, in other states especially, to, pick it, to put those together, right? Yeah, we've been seeing it in other states, and I think it's a lot of for a lot of businesses. It's just the risk of it, and, and so they just want certainty. They want to know that they're doing the things that they can do to keep their employees and their customers safe, like the speaker said. But they don't want these frivolous lawsuits hanging over their head, and that's a risk in business on a variety of areas. And COVID's just one of them, and so this is one that. Other, like the speaker said, other states are doing it. This is a reasonable way to set a reasonable standard, and that's all that we're trying to do here. Mr. Mr. Speaker, and any of you gentlemen, with regard to the bills circulating in the Capitol this week regarding voter uh, eligibility absentee ballots, the notion of having folks who are indefinitely confined having to provide a doctor's note every two years, the idea of separating the application from the ballot on absentee ballots, when there's been no proof of voter fraud connected to either indefinite confinement or these absentee ballots and the application beyond the envelope, is this really the best use of the legislature's time to, to be taking up this type of legislation? Now you make J.R. sound nonpartisan. Holy cow. Uh, <laughs> so, um, holy moly. Uh, let, let's first start with the very basic idea that a large chunk of the public believes that there are issues with our election system. That's why we ordered an audit, and we are going to go through and have professionals look at this and say, okay, where are there real issues? Where are there things that are not? Uh, do I believe that there are problems with the election system? Of course I do. Uh, we know that there were unlawfully cast ballots in the last election cycle. That is an absolute positive fact. So the idea that we want to go look and say, how do we make sure that every possible person who wants to vote in this state does it lawfully, should be something that has broad, bipartisan, unanimous support. 
Uh, but that's the challenge that we have, that some people seem to think that their side benefits from fraudulent and unlawful voting. Uh, I don't think either side should benefit from that. So we were not consulted on the bills that Senator Strobel put out. Uh, I certainly believe that some of them have good ideas in them, some of them have problems. Uh, but we're going to go through a very thorough vetting process. We're going to have a discussion about what's appropriate and what's not. We're going to engage the public because we want to make sure that people do have confidence in our election system. Uh, but the very idea that somebody who is out you know, uh, living their normal life, um, acting as if they are not indefinitely confined, and using that as a way to circumvent the photo ID law should be something that all of us are upset about. You know, the whole point of having the indefinitely confined is to meet constitutional muster. Somebody who's in a, a nursing home or an assisted living facility where they can't get out to get a photo ID. I, I support that basic idea. So I don't know if the idea of a doctor's excuse has happened in any other state. I don't know if it's constitutional. It's just too early to say. But I certainly think that the idea of looking at the process to guarantee that people have a way to vote legally, but that we try to make sure that we have unlawfully cast ballots uh, not be accepted as part of our process seems to be fair. Robin, Speaker Speaker Boss, what, um, in the, over the past few weeks, this will be the second bill um, that, the, that they're going to be sending to Governor Evers, right? The tax cuts for PPD loans, this unemployment bill is expected to land on his desk after today. But what about the COVID relief bill? Are you still in negotiations about that? What are the next steps on finding bipartisanship on that? Yeah, I mean, that's still our goal. Uh, I think that the bill that Governor Evers vetoed should have been signed. Uh, there was nothing in there that was anywhere near the level of poison pill that were in Governor Evers' budget, where he had things that were so radical, repealing Act 10, you know, things that would never, ever happen that really are poison pills. The things that we put into the budget, I'm sorry, that we put into AB1, which should have gotten signed, are common sense, not mandating that anybody has to get a vaccine, not being able to close down churches, a lot of things, you know, requiring the legislature to be involved when we have billions of dollars of federal money to spend, all things that were common sense and frankly got signed by governors in other states of different parties. So they shouldn't be things that are radical in Wisconsin. So so my hope is to go back and look at some of those issues and see if we have a way that we can get that bipartisan support that other states have found. Uh, but it's interesting also that many of the things in the bill, um, as we see good news from the state of Wisconsin where more folks are getting vaccinated, we know that we certainly are seeing the increase in the um, you know, businesses that are reopening and having a better opportunity to compete in the private sector marketplace. So. Do we have all the same needs that we might have had in January? Probably, but we have to kind of look at those over and see what's possible. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you. Have you talked to your old college buddy if he's going to run for governor? <laughs> we do say it regular time. Is he, is, he, is he talking to you about that? This program is a production of Wisconsin Eye, an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit media network with a mission to inform, educate, and engage the citizens of Wisconsin. Wisconsin Eye is the nation's first and only independently funded state civics broadcast network, providing gavel-to-gavel -gavel access to government proceedings and events at the state capitol.